Hello and welcome to this slightly belated video, where today I'm going to be having a first look at the latest version of Ubuntu Studio, which is Ubuntu Studio 20.10 Groovy Gorilla. Now just before we get any further into the video, I must explain why the video doesn't look particularly great. So on previous videos, I've always had the distribution installed onto an actual like hard drive or an SSD, on actual physical hardware that I've been like recording off of. But due to one of the big differences in this particular version of Ubuntu Studio, which I'm going to be getting to later, uh, I'm actually running this one through VirtualBox, uh, as I've decided to test it out this way first, rather than just going gung-ho and straight into installing it. And yeah, a little issue VirtualBox seems to be having, and it seems to be having it when the host operating system is both Linux and Windows. It just seems to be a VirtualBox issue. And yes, I could look at a QMEU, I think it is, and I tried to install that, but couldn't, couldn't get it quite working. So I thought rather than spending ages and causing the video to be even later than it already is, uh, I would just uh, stick with this as is. So uh, yeah, this is this is 800 by 600 that I've zoomed in on. It still gives us a pretty good idea as to how the desktop is. And speaking about desktops, the first major and largest difference between Ubuntu Studio, sort of the previous versions, 20.4 and previous, and 20.10 is the fact that the team has changed the main desktop environment of the distribution. That's right. It used to be XFCE. And for those of you still using 20.04, which is LTS, you will still be using XFCE. But for versions from 20.10 onwards, they've switched it over to the very, very capable KDE Plasma environment. Now, in previous videos, I've, I've actually spoken about XFCE and KDE in, in, in both quite positive manners. And I think they're both very, very similar. I think they're two of the most customizable full desktop environments. And I've always said that even though people often compare KDE Plasma and GNOME, I actually think that the real GTK equivalent to KDE is actually XFCE. And this is mostly due to their general presentation, but as well as that, just how customizable they are. And due to this great customizability, it's only if you really know what to look out for, or on a second glance, that you would actually be able to tell apart, just from looking, a copy of 20.04 and 20.10. You'd have to really know the little differences between the desktop environments because the Ubuntu Studio team here, with the theming and everything they've used, have done a fantastic job of keeping consistency with their previous releases of the distribution. And it really does just look like Ubuntu Studio. It has completely its own sort of character and its own look. And in my own uses of the system, I normally adjust it and change it because, you know, I want to customise it how I like it to look. But they've done a really good job with the theming and everything in making it look and feel like you're using any older version of Ubuntu Studio. So if I quickly bring up the uh, file manager here, which is uh, Dolphin, which is going to be one of the big differences, as uh, Dolphin is KDE's file manager, whereas Thuna is XFC's file manager, you'll see that they're using the same theme. I believe this is the Papyrus theme. So all the icons and everything and the, uh, well... I was about to call it the GTK theme, but in this case, it's going to be the Qt, the Qt theme, is uh, is made to be incredibly reminiscent of the previous versions. And, well, when it comes to a distribution designed with creatives in mind, one of those creatives being graphic designers and artists, of course, you would expect nothing less from this team. They've done a very good job of making it feel like it's Ubuntu Studio, not that it's, you know, Ubuntu Studio plus this or Ubuntu Studio plus that. It still has kept its general identity, even though the desktop environment has completely changed. And so that's where a lot of the biggest changes in, in this particular release are going to be. There are other changes that we're going to be looking at, and of course I'm going to be going through them in this video, but that's the major change. So rather than boring you with each particular, you know, XFCE thing being removed and what particular KD thing it's replaced, I'm going to just leave it as read that anything that was XFCE is now KDE. It's just like switching from Zubuntu or Xubuntu to Kubuntu. And speaking of which, actually, let me on to my next point, is the... I've been watching some of the posts on different social media that the Ubuntu Studio team have been bringing up and even some articles on their own website about the sheer amount of work they've had to pump into this particular release of the distribution. Now obviously there's always going to be work put into every new release of distribution, but with this release there seemed to be a hell of a lot more involved and it was involved specifically in making KDE not just being Kubuntu. Because, of course, the only other main, you know, properly certified Ubuntu version that used KDE, or really until Lubuntu changed to LXQt, the only thing using a Qt based desktop environment was KDE and was Kubuntu. So, a lot of specific things like specific tools, and I think the installer they had to even change, you know, it wasn't just a case of like switching in and out branding, there was some things like hard coded in there that would say, oh, this is Kubuntu, which of course they're gonna have to adjust because it's not Kubuntu. 
it's Ubuntu Studio. It looks like a hell of a lot of work went into making this look seamless, and so far, through messing around with this, I've not come across anything that thinks I'm using Kubuntu. It's all properly Ubuntu Studio. It feels really polished, really tidy, really, really nice. And actually, I do feel like I must apologise for the fact that I'm running this uh, 800 by 600 as it's just not going to show off quite how good KD Plasma looks and how good it's going to look with this particular distribution. So if you're planning on upgrading to the latest version of this or you always like KD Plasma, then by all means, install this on a proper hard drive or a proper SSD, proper hardware, and see how nice it's going to look for yourself. So whenever we jump over to the website here, we're just going to be using the host machine, which is still running uh, 20.04. Uh, an interesting thing that you have here about the upgrading, it's uh, due to the changing in desktop environments, they have a little thing here about upgrading saying that direct upgrades to Ubuntu Studio 20.10, meaning upgrading from any of the older releases, be it 20.04, if it's 19.10, 19.04, etc, etc, is not supported. And actually the team recommends a clean install, meaning you should make a new media, meaning a USB stick or a DVD, and to actually reinstall the whole distribution again from 20.10. Now, not supported does not mean impossible. So uh, I think I might be trying out, just to be a little bit cheeky, seeing if I can actually make the XFCE 20.04 upgrade and just see if all the base packages upgrade and I'm still left with XFCE. If not, if that all goes to hell, then I'll just properly install the new version anyway. But I'll be honest, I'm still on the fence. However, a little spoiler for my little outro here. The more I use this, the more I'm coming around to the idea of KDE. Like I said before, KDE and XFC are the what I think to be the two best desktop environments. So having to use KDE is nothing at all to be sad about. So, Ubuntu Studio is built upon standard Ubuntu, which is also built upon Debian. And between these particular releases, there's normally just sort of general updates of all the different bits and bobs and all the components and utilities and libraries and everything that goes into Ubuntu. We'll obviously go into the subsidiaries, such as Ubuntu Studio. And I've quickly read through some of the notes for that. And I think one of the things that's going to affect, or should affect, most of the versions of Ubuntu, which I think should be quite interesting, is uh, ZFS, the uh, Z file system. Uh, I think this is mostly developed by BSD, but I could be wrong there. Uh, it's normally more of a like a server style or like a NAS style sort of file system. And it was introduced with the uh, last version of Ubuntu, I believe, and uh, it was seen as being experimental. And I've heard that in the normal, more GTK-based installer for the mainline version of Ubuntu, which is just Ubuntu, that it's now no longer seen as experimental. This is quite good for me, as uh, I was planning at some point in the future to maybe get a couple of server or NAS style hard drives, something like a WD Red and seeing if I can run them in the RAID that ZFS allows you to use. RAID Z, RAID Z, uh, however you'd like to pronounce it. So that's something that's um, updated in this. And of course, we're going to have a newer version of the Linux kernel. Uh, we're using, on this particular release, we're using 5.8.0-26, and this is the low latency version. This is one of the big, big selling points of Ubuntu Studio, is the fact that the kernel is low latency, which is really going to help with audio recording. Speaking of audio recording, one big thing that we have in this particular version is going to be, of course, the big free and open source door, DAW, Digital Audio Workstation in Linux, which is our door. And in this particular version of Ubuntu Studio, it is upgraded to our door version 6, which I'm actually going to have to flash up pictures on the screen as it seems that um, while I'm recording using OBS here on the host system, it seems it doesn't quite want to open our door 6, but that's not to worry, as uh, there's a thing I'm going to mention a little bit later, the backport. Yeah, so the previous versions of our door in the older version of Ubuntu Studio was 5 point... Is that a 5.12 or 5.14? Forgive me for forgetting, because I've actually been able to upgrade that. But yeah, if you don't tend to want to use PPAs to get more up-to-date versions of software on your distribution, then you now have the option to have... I think it's Ardor 6.3, which is the very latest version of Ardor. Fantastic digital audio workstation, of course. It is free and open source software, so it can easily be packaged into this uh, distribution just to be used straight off the bat. Another fantastic thing about it is that it is cross-platform. So I know there's a couple of other ones like Qtractor in here, which are Linux only. And uh, I tend not to lean so much towards programs like that as you want to be as practical as possible, especially if you're a musician. And so you want to be able to use software that is used upon any other computer whenever you can, depending whom you're working with. So this is brought, this is brought up to a version 6.3. But one fantastic thing Ubuntu Studio have been doing is they have a couple of different backports. Now, backports, for those of you who don't know, it's basically a way of plugging in like a PPA, so it's essentially it gives you uh, packages from a different source other than the main release. And backports normally are things that are intended for future releases, which you can have if you want to make your software up to date. If not, it'll just be at this stable level that it will be for the next six months or so until, in this case, 21.04. 
But if you want to get the newest stuff, then you could add in these back ports. And actually, if you're still using 20.04 and you want to use the latest version of Ardor, you can actually attach, which I've done, the Ubuntu Studio Ardor PPA, which is really, really good. It's the, it's the back ports for it. So it'll give you the latest version of Ardor, but then a previous, potentially more stable version of Ubuntu Studio. And this is a really, really good thing. This is something I really like about Ubuntu Studio, the fact that they give you this option. So you can say, okay, I'd like to stick with just what you see to be stable, or you can say, no, I want to have the latest thing. And one of the other great things about Ubuntu Studio, which I've praised them for in the past, is the fact that a lot of the things they make aren't just locked down to their own platform. Say, for example, you were using some, a different Ubuntu or rather Debian-based distribution, say Linux Mint, and you wanted to have that back port, you could easily enable that PPA. Now, obviously, with certain distributions, you know, your mileage may vary, but that option is still available to you. And that's something that's really, really good and really, really worthwhile. Something else which I'm going to be testing soon, and I know I've done a video on this previously about trying out different digital audio workstations, of course. If you want to use something that has a bit more name recognition, uh, Reaper is available on Linux. It is proprietary, but you can install it. It doesn't come included with Ubuntu Studio for this reason, though, but there's nothing stopping you from just downloading it and installing it yourself. Also, also on the subject of professional audio, uh, in previous versions of Ubuntu Studio, I think the last two versions, they brought out a thing which is the Ubuntu Studio Studio Controls, and they've now merged this, I think, with a different project, which is Studio Controls. They're, they're sort of, they're getting the upstream from it now. It'll look a lot better if you're using proper hardware that's actually going to show you the, the full screen properly. But through this, you have so many different like audio tweaks and setups and just anything you would want to. So say something of Jack isn't working, say you want to adjust the periods or have a different backend, you just adapt it, just change it. And it's a really, really useful, really, really powerful little tool. Because normally with a particular system, you're either stuck with whatever the operating system comes with, or you have to use the drivers which the uh, manufacturer of, say, your audio interface, for example, would provide, which they might have decided not to have supported those for years, or, say, they haven't supported the particular version of a particular operating system you're using. This just throws the idea of that out the window and says, no, we're going to control it, we're going to make it work, and it just gives you that finite control you need. And speaking of that finite control you need, and speaking about audio interfaces that are having things they deem to be depreciated, there's always this Firewire driver that Ubuntu Studio seems to uh, attach. Let's see if we can find it quickly. Here it is, it's the FFADO mixer. And uh, that's been there for the last couple of versions of Ubuntu Studio to try and help people who are still using Firewire cards. As unfortunately, I know some of the Firewire support had been pulled previously, which is really going to mess you around if you're using something like an audio interface, which uses Firewire, or any other piece of audio technology that might use Firewire, or, you know, simply a hard drive that uses one. But luckily, with this particular version of Ubuntu Studio, uh, they're bringing those drivers back. So hallelujah, you can use those again. And I think they are also enabled through Studio Controls, so you can mess around with them and adjust them as you see fit through that. Very, very useful. Um, I would also like to comment on Thunderbolt, but I don't know if there's much being said about that at the moment. I think that's the next thing to be looking forward to if they haven't mentioned it already. And just one more thing before we just go deep diving straight into having a look at all the particular programs and apps and pieces of software installed on this particular version of Ubuntu Studio is that um, I previously mentioned the backports for Ardor, and I mentioned there were other backports. There is, of course, also the main Ubuntu Studio backports you can use, which will help with lots of other things. As Ubuntu Studio isn't just made for musicians, but obviously being a musician myself, I'm going to be having a very music-centric point of view on this. So if any other piece of software gets an update and they plan on using that in 20. Point uh, well, it'll now be 21.04, but had they done 20.10, you could use the back ports to get updates through there. I know that a couple of versions ago, when they started really giving a bit of spit and polish to the distribution and making it look fantastic, uh, if you attach the back ports, you would start getting all the new themes and everything added in, and that makes everything look really good. But as well as that, it's quite a good companion to go along with the Ardor back ports, if you were planning on using that as any updates to particular plugins, be they VST, LADSPA, or LV2, will be sent through that backport so you can have everything as up-to-date as possible. So once again, it's just a trade-off of potential stability versus upgraded features. It's all down to the user, and of course, at any point, if you want to remove a backport, you can remove a backport and just carry on as you had been going before. Now, something I've been talking about with these Ubuntu Studio videos for a long time is uh, OBS here. So let's have a quick look, and let's see what version of OBS we're running here, as I know OBS hadn't been included for a while, and then it, it was, but it was the 0.01 really, really old, like grandfather old Debian version. And then I think they had done some updates recently, so let's just see which version it has come pre-installed. 26.0.2, fantastic, as that is currently what I'm using here to record, and it's such a useful piece of software. 
Uh, just a brilliant screen recorder. There are, of course, other screen recorders that you can have, such as a simple screen recorder. There's probably other ones that I've just completely forgotten about. So comment section below, add in a great screen recorder if you'd like. But obviously this is used for streaming as well. I just think it's a invaluable piece of software to have included on a distribution, especially a distribution which is geared towards content creators. Okay, and one final thing before we dive into having a look at all the particular pieces of software on here, just for the good old fun of it, the uh, dark table image has been changed just for the Halloween season, which is which is really fun. And a completely new piece of software has joined us from KDE, so it'll fit in quite nicely. This is Digicam. And most things I've mentioned in here to do with stuff like OBS and Ardor and the controls and everything can be found on Ubuntu Studio's website under the new section with their release of 20.10. And I might actually include this in the description below so you can have a read through yourself. Now let's have a look at all those programs. So if you click up here, it's now, whoa, it's not the, it's not the whisker menu anymore, but uh, the KD menu is really, really quite good actually. And we have some favorites on here, but we're just going to go straight into applications, which is their version of saying just all. And we're going to go through everything one after another. So let's dive straight in with audio production. And of course, you can see there's categories within categories within categories. And it's not quite like the olden days of things like uh, Windows XP or Windows 98, where it, where it starts spreading more along the screen. It'll just move along as if you're going through a file system. And then you have a simple selection up here where you can move across. We have more subcategories up here, which we're going to have a look through. Audio utilities. We have the controls for Carla and for Jack. And this is the Q Jack control. So it's going to be a QT based or Qt. Definitely helps seeing as we've now moved from a GTK to a Qt based desktop environment. Under effects. Now this is where it gets a bit mad. I'm going to go into this LSP plugin soon. But just, you know, we have stuff like auto shoot. You know, if you want to you want to use that i'm not a huge fan of that myself but you know different genres carla for the for the plugins uh guitar X and guitar rack for basically amp simulation and effects simulation got some mastering interfaces and some reverbs here but then oh lord if we go into lsp plugins we have just everything you would need i am not gonna bore you to death by reading all these out i would recommend booting up a live cd distribution or just installing it yourself to have a go through them but as anyone knows who's used to using something like a daw a digital audio workstation is that the daw itself is more just just the environment for the recording and normally any minute things that need to be changed about each channel apart from you know gain volume panning stuff like that can normally be done through plugins and effects like this and yeah i had a quick read through this earlier this this gives you basically everything you'd need now of course you can never have enough plugins so there are always other ones you can try and install and like i said the main gw that comes installed with ubuntu studio is our door which supports many different plugin categories so you can try all those this should definitely keep you going for a long time if there's an effect that's missing from here then you can just go and find another one anyway and just install that and away you go if we go back again to audio production we now have the instruments it's going to give you some virtual instruments the uh, alios organ emulator different plugins it's mostly synthesizers there are some drum plugins here which i think is odd that it's not in the instrument section but maybe they classify it slightly differently if we go back and go into midi utilities we're going to have stuff like keyboards with keyboards like this it's like a virtual keyboard if you don't have a physical one lots of different just uh, midi plugins i don't remember this mcp disc before so i'm gonna have to look into what that does that'll be very useful nice to always see things being added Go to mixers and card controls. This is where I previously mentioned a support for Firewire uh, mixers. Now there's the jack mixer and pulse audio and stuff in here, but there are specific things for specific sound cards. If you're running, say, a particular sound card which has which tends not to be supported by the Linux kernel, normally this will have your back. And uh, I also always find it funny that I see this being written as Hammerfall, as it just makes me think of Daggerfall. Back to audio production now. We're, we are out of these subcategories. We're just going to go through the last little bit. There's not a huge amount there, but it's mostly like bigger utilities. So we have obviously the aforementioned studio controls here. We have some uh, monitoring for, I think this is connected to some of the other plugins we looked at before. We have meter bridge as a audio level meter. Ardor, as previously mentioned. Audacity, which is very useful for quick recording and quick editing of some audio. I wouldn't necessarily want to use it for a full album. I mean, there's probably people who've proven that you can, but for just quick sound recording, say like podcasts, things like that, it does the job really, really well. Here are the drum plugins. Okay, so they are in here still got some control utilities some more synths she on kicks so it's a percussion synthesizer i do find it interesting actually that we have instrument plugins here and we have some synthesizers and some drum machines as well like the hydrogen one not included in there i wonder what the uh, thinking behind that was as in my mind i would surely put all these in there and you probably can edit it yourself to add it in there if you so choose kid 3 audio tagger once again we're using uh kde cute based applications here this is for adjusting things like you know album name artist name genre on different like audio files so it could be like mp3 it could be like wav flac stuff like that 
Uh, LMMS, which is a uh, audio production suite. This is more like sequencing in the sense that it's almost all things like MIDI and software and digital work, although maybe they've added in audio recording yet. A general rule of thumb is that our door is normally very good for music that reco revolves recording, such as bands. Whereas LMMS would be great for electronic music, however there are some people, you know, if you've ever seen Unfa's channel, they can prove that you could do just pure electronic on our door, no problem. So really, they're both worth having a mess around with, having a little practice with, and seeing which is going to suit your particular style more. Got MuseScore here, which in my personal opinion is one of the best notation editors you can have. The two I'm most familiar with is Sibelius and MuseScore, and honestly, I've come to the point now where I actually recommend people just use MuseScore over Sibelius, as they basically do the same thing, but MuseScore is free and it's more cross-platform in a sense it's also available on linux got some legacy gui for um audio session manager not quite sure what that is never used it really myself petrifu pure data which i think is more of like a coding language hacking based audio piece of software uh, that goes way over my head i couldn't code my way out of a cardboard box but i know that there's other things like super collider which do a very similar thing so if that's your cup of tea then you go for it Q jack control is there again so once again just for controlling the jack session Q tractor which is it calls itself a sequencer but i think it can record audio don't exactly quote me on that i've never really used it it's a digital audio workstation it doesn't seem to get as much of a fanfare as our door does and i've mentioned this previously i think one of its biggest downsides is the fact that it's only available on linux uh, maybe it's on bsd as well but it's not on things like windows and mac os and I know some people have a big like philosophical issue with it being, you know, proprietary versus open source. But really, I think as a musician, you obviously use the tool that's the best tool. But also, if you're collaborating with other people, I would just want to use something that is as cross-platform as possible. Which is why I tend to favour things like Ardor or things like Reaper over things like Q-Tractor. However, it doesn't stop you from making really good music if you can. So it's entirely up to you what you'd like to use. Race testing, which I've never really used, Slooper Looper, and Zen. I think this is the Zen Fusion style software plugins for synthesizers. So that gives us audio production. And uh, if anyone's ever watched one of my videos like this before, as well as realizing that I speak incredibly quickly, which I apologize for, I'm gonna try and slow down. I realize that once I get into the other categories, I tend to talking a lot less because uh, even though I do the tiniest bit of graphic design for, well, literally just like my thumbnails in these videos, and obviously I do video production because I have a YouTube channel, I tend not to know a lot about the next few categories. So bear with me, I'll walk you through it. And if you know anything more than me, then you can tell me in the comments or you can investigate it more yourself. I'm your light tour guide here. So we're going to graphic design. Lots of graphics utilities here. Normally, it's almost always stuff like, you know, image magic and stuff for scanning. Uh, I noticed they have two scanning applications here with it. Normally, I think they just have document scanner. But I think it's like a GTK, whereas scan, like the use of the K there, makes me think it's connected to KDE. So interesting to see that they have two here when you want to just assume you just need the KDE based one. However, you know, it could be slight teething issues. Maybe one was installed due to it needing to be a part of another package. But hey, if one doesn't work, then fingers crossed the other one will work for you instead. Back to graphic design. We're now going to photography. This is heading even deeper into things I just don't understand. Uh, dark table, which is, I know, for editing, I think it's like raw images. Uh, we have Digicam, which was uh, previously mentioned, a photo management program by KDE. Have Entangle, which is for like camera capture. So I think you can like plug a camera in and use it as like maybe a webcam or like a digital version of a camera. You you tell me. Gwenview, and this is going to be uh, replacing Riz Ristoretto, I think it's called, which is just, it's just, it's just the image viewer. So like if you're used to using GNOME, you'd have Eye of GNOME, stuff like that. It's just the main utility for opening images on this particular desktop environment. And we have Rapid Photo Downloader, which is good if you take a million and one pictures on your camera and then just want to just dump everything off of it. Rather than going one by one, although there might be features in it to adjust, I'm not quite sure. I've never used it myself. Go back to graphic design, we have Blender, which is a 3D modeler animator and also a um, video editor and I know that in previous versions of Ubuntu Studio that use the XFC desktop environment that you can actually find this in multiple categories to so see if that's come across with it as well. Uh, ebook viewer for viewing ebooks obviously. Font Forge for editing and viewing the different fonts on your system and that's something that's normally never really screams much about but is a big thing to do with Ubuntu Studio is the fact that there's always loads and loads and loads of fonts and I think you can actually download the Ubuntu Studio fonts package on other like Ubuntu based distributions if you just want to have a hell of a lot of fonts. We have GIMP, the GNU image and manipulation program. I think it's a fantastic piece of uh, graphics editing software. I use it all the time. Personally, I would always use it over something like Photoshop. That said, really, I only ever tend to use graphics for stuff like thumbnails and other things, so I'm not exactly a graphic designer. However, it's free and it does a fantastic job, so I really can't complain. I think it's really, really good, honestly. And you know what else is pretty fantastic? Is GPIC. Basically, you click on it. I'll show you quickly, why not? 
Turbo Mouse goes, you'll see in this little box down here, it shows you what you're looking at, and then here it gives you the color code. So if you want to make something using a particular color code, say you're using this in conjunction with something like GIMP, then it just gives you color codes. Makes life so, so easy. Fantastic piece of software. Got Hugin, which looks new, I believe. I'm not quite sure what it is. Inkscape, which is vector graphics. So graphics which, when you scale them to be large or smaller, don't or at least shouldn't have degradation in the quality. Very, very useful, especially if you're doing things like logos. Critter, which is the KDE painting program. Uh, some people tend to see it as a competitor with GIMP by also proxy being a competitor with things like Photoshop. So if you're a graphic designer or simply an artist, especially if you're using like one of those, is it Wacom tablets, the ones you write on, then you might definitely want to give both a go. Uh, LibreOffice Draw, once again, a very similar thing. This is a bit more office-y. We've got more viewers for different things. Got, oh, another paint program. I guess this is a probably a bit more of a simpler paint program. Uh, Ocular, which is the PDF reader for KD. And actually, I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. Ocular is really, really good. And I've actually switched out Adobe Acrobat or DC or whatever they call it nowadays, the proper Adobe PDF reader on Windows. I've now swapped it out for using Ocular on Windows because of how powerful this PDF reader is. It's 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 weird. Do you think of a PDF reader as, as being just, you know, it just allows you to read PDFs? And I don't exactly do intensive things like editing them loads, but it's really, really good. It, you have to use it to see how just good it is. Pixel Pixel, which is for pixel art. Scribus, which is for, I believe the idea is this is like page layout. So stuff like if you didn't just want to do a really boring like document style page, say you were creating a novel and you wanted to do some stylizing within your pages, then this would be the way to do it. And Synfix Studio, which is 2D vector animation studio. Once again, I think there's animation, so I imagine it's to do with like moving, but you know, if you know, you know. We're going back to all applications again. And one of the last major categories we have here, the categories which differentiate Ubuntu Studio from other versions of Ubuntu, is the video production. So go on here, there's no other subcategories, and it's just these. So we have Blender. As I said before, Blender is, as well as being a 3D modeler and animator, also can be used as a video editor. I know some people like to do that. Uh, we have DVD, which is going to be in conjunction with K3B. So for uh, creating and then burning DVDs and CDs, really useful to have utility. I know some people see this as completely redundant technology, but I have a, well, I have a Blu-ray read and writer on my computer. So I still find using like discs like CDs, DVDs and Blu-rays to be quite useful. And sometimes the best way to get some music across to someone, especially if say that person doesn't have very good internet, say depending where they live, then, you know, a good old CD or DVD. Can't go wrong with it, especially if they have a CD player as well. Then we have Cajun Life, which is my personal uh, video editor of choice. And there are a couple of updates that happened through the PPA and then more recently into the distributions, which have solved some long-standing issues with this. And it's, it's, it's much, much better than it had been before. OBS Studio, which I've mentioned before, which is used for screen recording and for streaming. Uh, it's actually what I'm filming this video on right now. Snowmo UI, I'll be honest, I had a guess what this was last time and was informed I was wrong. So uh, if you know what this is, then fantastic. I'm not too clued up on it as it's not something I ever tend to use. Subtitle editor, does what it says on the tin. And the XJack video monitor, which I think XJDO, which I think I was, I was planning on uninstalling at one point, but if you tend to compose music or just sound art over a video and you're doing that using something like our door, then you want to keep this installed as it should work with that. Okay, now for the for the sort of smaller, more standard categories. So we're going to just quickly brush through these. Uh, in games, I think it's quite interesting that a difference between KDE and XFC is the fact that they actually subcategorize the games, which is either great or not great, depending on how you see it. So in here we've got Logic Games, and that's just going to be Sudoku. And in Tactics and Strategy, we have Minesweeper. Or K-Mines. In Internet, we have the Firefox browser. We have the KDE Connect, which is actually in the old XFC versions as well. So if you have a phone which has KDE Connect on it, or if not, you want to install it, then you can use it alongside this. Uh, Conversation, which is a IRC chat client. KTorrent, which is a torrent client for KDE. Once again, I think this is going to be replacing things like Transmission. And Thunderbird, which I believe anyway to be the best email client. Then if we go into media playback, this is normally where some other things start to come in and things start to cross over, like the LibreOffice suite. So uh, this looks like this might be a bit of a glitch. This seems to now be showing basically all the applications in one go. So I think there's a slight issue here. I don't know if this is more to do with Ubuntu Studio or if this is to do with KDE itself. However, the main playback pieces of software you can find on here would be things like VLC, 
which really is the big one in Linux. Uh, normally there are different pieces of media playback, so video and music playback software that comes with uh, different desktop environments. I'm trying to think off the top of my head what the KD video one would be. VLC actually is a cute QT based application, so it'll work quite well. We've also got things like a Voco screen here. Eliza, which is the new default music player that KD have brought in. I think they used to use Amarok. But Eliza is the new one here, and I've heard good things about it. I haven't tried out yet. I'm quite keen to try it, though. Let's move away from that, as it seems like that directory needs to be edited a little bit. Quickly going to Office, we've got Calibri, Calibri, however you want to say it. Ebook editors, stuff like that. Uh, and the LibreOffice suite, which is uh, really quite good if you haven't used it before. And it's basically just like using Microsoft Office, but it's free and open source. PDF Arranger and the Plume Creator, which is a different piece of writing software. I've never really used it myself, but I know that some writers do prefer to use it over things like Writer. Under Science and Maths, we just have LibreOffice Maths and we have uh, Cyril, which is, ooh, astronomical imaging. Ooh, I like that. I like things like space. I might be having a look at that later. Under Settings, we have stuff like the Studio Controls again. And something I just realized now for the first time they have here, which I'm very happy about, is the Synaptic Package Manager, which is quite an old package manager. Think of it like the GNOME Software Center or in KDE's case, which you haven't come across yet. You have things like KDE Discover, which is the far flashier looking version of essentially an app store, for lack of a better term. And Synaptic Package Manager is one for Debian-based distribution that's been around for a lot, lot longer. And normally it's one of the first things I install on any Debian-based distribution I'm using. Because when I've had packages break before and I can't quite work out how to fix them in the command line, Synaptic always swoops in to save the day. So I always make sure it's installed from the start in case I'm blocked from installing things due to like, you know, um, broken packages and things like that, that this can always come in and save the day. And I'm really glad to see this here because honestly, it's a lifesaver. And there's probably ways of fixing the issues I said I was having with like the terminal. But if you can't quite work that out, lovely, easy to use GUI, go in there, broken packages, fix them or uninstall them, done. Really good little uh, inclusion here. And I'm glad that that's in there. Go back and go to system. This should be where you find, uh -huh, here we go, Discover, which uh, isn't using the normal icon, as like I said, we're using the, I think it's Papyrus icon theme here. Uh, really, really good software center. Basically feels like the GNOME one, but just looks a lot better in my personal opinion. General sort of system tools here. KD make a lot of tools for lots of different things. So some of the things here you might not want to use. Some of them you might. If I go back out again, got utilities. Once again, general usage things here to do with fonts and things. Oh, this is something I always forget about. Is the fact that uh, <laughs> KD has emojis uh, built in. Very, very 21st century. Have things like archiving tools, calculator, general system utilities here just to be used whenever. Bundle Studio information, this is always included. It just gives you links mostly to different websites like mailing lists, a way to contribute to Bundle Studio, their website themselves. Uh, a nice little thing here is Ask Ubuntu, which is a website where you can just ask general questions about Ubuntu and get answers to fix things. Really, really helpful. Nice they've included that. And yeah, the, the little help center. And so, so far, things are looking to be quite a strong little upgrade here for Ubuntu Studio. Like I said, the biggest improvement here, or the biggest change, is the fact that they've switched over from XFC to KDE. And whether you want to make the change or not is going to be sort of whatever suits you the most. I'm really, really liking KDE, and every time I use it, every time I hear people using it, I'm slightly pulled away. It's just a little bit more, and a little bit more from XFC, but something is just keeping me wanting to continue to use XFC for now anyway. So I think I'm going to try and upgrade to 20.10. Uh, Obviously, I want all the uh, upgraded features, but I'm maybe think of sticking with XFC for now. But this has really, really tempted me. I'm, I've definitely I've definitely changed my tune a lot towards KDE. And I'm loving everything in this. So uh, yeah, for the most part, it seems like a nice, solid upgrade. There's done a really, really good job there. And really, one or two little hiccups like that menu that's, that's directory seems to not quite be set up properly. But other than that, gives you all the latest versions of all the software you want to use as a creator, as a musician, a video editor, a photographer, a writer or a graphic designer, or just an artist in general, any any form of creative, it's going to be a fantastic distribution just to go straight out of the box into whatever you need to make. And the EKD desktop environment is a fantastic companion to go along with that. So, what I'm going to be doing, as I normally do, is halfway through its life cycle, I'm going to be doing a more of a proper review when I've been using it for a lot longer. And like I said, I'm going to try and upgrade my XFC version, but I'm going to be going back and forth, I think, between KDE and XFC and seeing which one I like more, which one I like less. I'm going to give a general review halfway in its life cycle to see how the distribution is holding up in a couple of months' time. Sorry for the very, very long rambly video. I hope it didn't speak too quickly. And uh, if you enjoyed this, please like, share and subscribe. And I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.